Hi. Good afternoon, good morning, good night, wherever you are. Welcome to the last session of the 2022 Bean International Seminar organized by Initiativa Bean. My name is Sergio Alvarez, and I will be the host and moderator for this, the very last session of our seminar. Initiativa Beam is an academic focus group with members of 21 organizations from eight different countries. Our goal is to connect students and faculty with leaders and experts on information management and technology innovation in the architecture, engineering, and construction and operation industry. The 2002 2022 International Seminar was created aligned with our mission statement. That is why we have invited to participate as a speaker in this humble event, people who are making the difference, game changers, to share their experience and point of view on how to move forward and pursuing excellence in this industry that we all participate. Today, we have with us Bilal Zucker. He is a world-class expert in building information modeling in a very productive researchers in beam adoption, beam, beam adoption, which by the way, is the topic that he will be presented to, to us today. So now let me give the voice to Fernanda to present Villar in a more proper way. So please, Fernanda, go ahead. Thank you very much, Professor Sergio. Now I'm gonna talk about Villar Sucker. Bilal Sucker is a strategic advisor and independent researcher focusing on digital performance assessment and improvement in the built environment. He is the director of Change Agents AEC, changeagents.com.au, a digital transformation consultancy operating out of Melbourne, Australia. Dr. Sucker is the founder of the not for profit BIM E initiative, known as BIMEXcellence.org a community of 160 plus researchers from 42 countries and the head editor of the International BIM Dictionary, known as BIMDictionary.com, covering 27 languages, including Spanish. Bilal published highly cited academic journals, led prominent BIM education initiatives and delivered keynote addresses and workshops across the world covering digital transformation in macro BIM adoption. Dr. Zucker, Stated, stated mission is to encourage continuous performance improvement, international collaboration, and open knowledge sharing. Let's give a warm welcome to Bilal Sucker. So thank you, Fernanda. Welcome, Bilal Sucker. And I remember the audience that you will not be able to open your mic during the presentation. And I will activate the mix after the, the presentation during the question and answer session. So I will stop here and now the stage is yours, Bilal. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you so much uh, for this uh, invitation, uh, Professor Alvarez. Thank you so much, Fernanda, for uh, the introduction. Thank you all for the team. Um, I'm gonna now share my screen and start uh, the presentation. Very uh, honored to be with you uh, today. Okay, um, let's give this a go. Uh, today's presentation is about adoption, as has uh, mentioned uh, by Professor Alvarez, and um, there's so many things to cover when we discuss adoption. It's a, it's a topic that has been um, of interest, of course, um, over the past, let's say, 20 years. And we're still dealing with very similar issues, um, repetitive challenges across uh, markets. But we are now, uh, you know, after many, many years of focusing on bid information modeling and now, of course, digital twins and having, uh, you know, focus on stance, et cetera. We have learned many, many lessons uh, re regarding adoption, what, what to do, uh, sometimes what not to do. Um, well, typically, you know, what happens is that we forget uh, the basics and the things that we really should include in our approach to uh, adoption, you know, how we should understand uh, the topics of capability, the difference between um, capability and maturity and how they work together, um, how we should, you know, rely on, 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 on uh, uh, open collaboration with others in order to accelerate adoption within the market. So this presentation will cover 
you know, just a little bit about these topics. It's a huge, huge topic and will take many days to uh, to cover properly. Today's uh, title is Capability Stages and Maturity Levels. And we'll try to understand the performance within organization, uh, you know, as, an, as, a, as a unit, but also across markets. And as you will see, the language uh, differs between different scales, but at the same time, there's so many similarities that we can use um, when uh, addressing adoption at smaller and larger scales. Um, so today's um, session outline, we are going to introduce you to the BIM Excellence Initiative or BIMI Initiative, uh, background research uh, in, in this topic. Um, then we go through understanding capability and maturity and some other performance metrics. Um, and maybe just share with you a handful of lessons and then have a discussion. Uh, I'll try to finish within 40, 45 minutes and then have a you know open discussion with you if if, if at all possible. Um, so first, what is the, the BME initiative? Um, you know, um, it's not for profit, that, that's for sure. You know, um, we, we need to, to, to work together uh, openly, we, we want to, you know, work internationally in order to generate new knowledge, improve existing knowledge. Um, and one way of doing that is, is through, of course, academic research, uh, sometimes through, you know, government-supported approaches. But th there's also a place for volunteer-led um, or committee-based approaches uh, that would complement the other work happening in our industry. The driver would be would be is to offer a, an alternative to some of the discussions, uh, you know, typically you know delivered or the type of requirements that come top down through authorities, um, you know, governments and policymakers. At the same time, you know, complementing this with with a community approach. A community approach is very different to what you expect to hear from policy driven approach where it, uh, it it it's more prescriptive from a from a from a top down approach while a community would try to to lean on um understanding the you know what's what's you know what what researchers are doing trying to bring them together and try to formulate a kind of response that complements other approaches to to adoption and i'm hope i'm hoping this will become a little bit clearer uh, as we go through this presentation so it's it's kind of a response uh, to the to, to to the challenges we are all facing, and it is supported by you know organizations, associations. Uh, some of them help us uh, financially uh, because we have uh, tools that we develop, uh, etc., and provide them for free for everyone. So um, what's our mission? Uh, we want to accelerate the transformation. Transformation is happening, of course, but it, it, unless we, we, we actively accelerate it, it will uh, stagnate or it will go very slower, uh, much slower pace than other industries. Um, we want to demonstrate a different way of doing things, new ways of thinking about the problem, you know, trying to, to say, okay, this we try to solve this problem in a, in, a, in a certain way multiple times. Maybe it didn't really work. Maybe it worked partially. Maybe let's try new things. Um, and this is all from a knowledge engineering perspective. Uh, our goals are, you know, you know, and, and where we focus on is practitioners. I mean, of course, we do want to help students as well, uh, but uh, we look at students as future uh, practitioners. Um, this is, a, a, if you want, and um, it focuses on industry uh, um, needed research. Let's say, uh, try to assist organizations, uh, try to help policymakers, and this has been really a big focus in the past few years. Uh, as multiple or different countries try to move forward, uh, they want to understand what are the best steps to take. So try to focus on providing them with, with some of the lessons learned, some of the, the tools they need, some of the frameworks they need in order to move forward. What we deliver, we deliver um, what we refer to as tools, uh, like something like matrices and lists uh, that others can use to build their own um, matrices and lists as well. So it's, we, we provide components, knowledge components for people to rebuild their own um, knowledge infrastructure from. We conduct assessments um, in order to understand what works, what doesn't work really. Uh, 
we offer modular workflows, like generic modular workflows, so people can, you know, can build on. Uh, I won't be focusing today on this one, but there's other presentations if you're interested about how this, you know, is helpful and what, what, why, why do we do modular workflows? And we, of course, uh, you know, big part of what we do is to provide open access tools, not just open, uh, you know, access um, templates, but also open access tools. Hopefully, in, in the near future, we we will go from open access to open source as well. It's a big community, meaning this, this is an old picture, but you have more than 160 people now. They, it covers professors and students, practitioners, academics, so you name it. Um, from 75 years old to probably, I think the youngest was 17 or 18, um, professors, uh, you know, full professors down to uh, students at universities. We don't have people from school, you know, you know, uh, schools yet but our focus is mostly you know the type of work we do is of most benefit to undergraduate students in their late later years or you know final years we are mostly um targeted uh, towards postgraduate students and informed practitioners practitioners who within their own um companies they're trying to impact change and of course we focus on policy uh, makers uh, or you know, authorities uh, within governments and associations. 40 plus countries, uh, volunteer numbers. We are growing slowly, meaning we, we, are, we have been affected by the pandemic a bit, but we, we're hoping to, you know, get to um, you know, next year probably a couple of hundreds. Um, in, in three years, we, we want to go up to 500 uh, volunteers because we of the type of growth we're, we're experiencing in specific projects. Um, I won't have time today to go take you through the details of these projects, um, but I'm more than happy uh, to present this to you or to guide you or to provide you, you know, with links to see uh, the type of work we're doing. All info presented today, available. You know, including this presentation, I will, you know, provide it as a PDF later uh, to Professor Alvarez. Uh, you can share it if you if you like. Of course, this is on YouTube. You can watch it. Um, everything I'm going to say today is either based on peer-reviewed publications. So I won't, I won't go into the details of the, uh, you know, the, the theories and frameworks underlying uh, today's presentation. I will focus more on the essence of it. And also what we call peer-reviewed resources. And here we use the peer-reviewed between uh, square brackets to mean that the work we do, you know, is reviewed by the community, which includes really one of, you know, it's very a highly experienced community, um, which reviews every document before it's released. Uh, it's done internally, you know, you know, a couple of uh, times, with, uh, and then uh, it is uh, published. Um, you'll find information, more details. You'll find all these images I'm going to show today on a couple of, uh, you know, very slow-moving blogs. So there's, uh, you know, on YouTube, uh, we have our BIM Initiative uh, website. You can follow us on social media. So that was the very, very quick presentation of um, the BIM Excellence Initiative or BIM Initiative. Um, let's just say that uh, so far, we, we the demand or the, the request to join the initiative has far outstripped our ability to absorb people to come in, and, and we had to stop um, absorbing new volunteers because uh, it's it's very it's very hard to do like to organize a, a larger group than we have at the moment. We're working on it. Hopefully, in the, in the near future, we'll reopen um, some of these projects we're working on to absorb new talent. And of course, we need much many new times as we we branch into new themes and topics. Now, when we say BIM adoption, uh, capability and maturity, when we use the term BIM, this is just a disclaimer. Uh, when you hear the term BIM, it really means an umbrella term. It, it really uh, is about all the technologies, processes, and policies for digital transformation. Okay, for whether it's for designing, constructing, operating, any type of facility you can think of. Um, so it's it's an umbrella term, of course. In, in in some some researchers and you know of course some policymakers uh, would have defined BIM 
a little bit differently, including standards. But, but when you hear the term BIM uh, in this presentation, it means an umbrella term, and it covers lots of things, whether it, you name it, you know, whether you are familiar with virtual design and construction, which is mostly, I mean, in my understanding of, of its literature and the practitioners, uh, is it mostly a, a, an excellent method uh, within space, but doesn't focus as much on the operational side. It does cover, uh, you know, now the what's in fashion, digital twins, which is product focus uh, as, as opposed to, you know, uh, process or project focus. Um, covers digital engineering, which is here in Australia is a, is a, is a term used, especially in, in specific states, uh, more advanced than others, which is a more about design and construction as a method, and it's localized for 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 you know, so it, it fits with uh, with our you know working environment, integrated project delivery, you know, etc. Uh, BIM according to, to, to ISO 9650, which is mostly, uh, you know, it's a compliance approach uh, with the project focus. So the term BIM used today is a little bit wider than, uh, and inc includes all these concepts. Of course, they, you know, they, it doesn't cover every aspect of them. Um, some of them are a little bit more specialized than we can handle today when we're discussing capability and maturity. Um, we focus in, in, in uh, I would focus in, in this discussion more on the general aspect of how we 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 integrate um, uh, approaches to technology, approaches to policy, approaches to process. Um, it's very important to understand these distinctions, but at the same time, not to be blinded by them. One of the, the very important challenging ch challenges when discussing adoption is the, the confusion of scale and 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 really people miss un, uh, understanding um, scale when approaching adoption. What I mean by that is that when we want to improve digital performance, we really need to approach it holistically. I mean, uh, this would be within organizations. By improving the organizational systems, like uh, uh, their own um, what knowledge management systems, you know, whether it's training, whether it's how they handle technology, but also on individual competence, uh, you know, the ability of individuals to um, change their processes, use new technologies, adopt, uh, you know, what they need to comply with, etc. So. We have to go holistic. You have to go within organizations. We have to understand <clears throat> how BIM and digital transformation apply on projects, uh, which affects how we procure, uh, you know, services. It affects how we adopt and you know standardization. How we adopt them at what extent, and of course, information integration uh, across uh, a project uh, life cycle and a project team, but also across the whole market because all these things are. Are interrelated. So when we're discussing uh, adoption and capability and maturity and implementation, etc., we have to keep in you know in mind um, the differences between these different scales and the complementarity of these. I mean, they are complementary, and we cannot approach one without the other. Meaning, we cannot improve the performance on projects without improving uh, the performance of organizations, and we cannot improve the performance of organizations without improving the, the you know competence of uh, individuals, of course, and teams and groups, and and uh, you know by extension, we cannot improve adoption. We can improve digital performance across a sector or a discipline or a whole market uh, without uh, you know uh, improving uh, the smaller scales, and and hence uh, this kind of um, the diagram is, it looks a bit too complex on screen, but it's just, I identifies different scales that we can approach uh, implementation and adoption. And just a simplified version of this would be the, the, this two, 12 scales. And we can say we, the, there are strategies that, that someone concerned with adoption or concerned with uh, you know, implementation and learning and assessment that they can ado adopt at what we refer to at micro scales. Um, other approaches which we focus on would be on this middle scale, the meso scale, uh, the teams, of the, the, the different you know organizations working together to deliver an asset, and of course on my macro scale, um, where we're looking at what are the adoption approaches, adoption metrics, uh, specific or you know useful 
to encourage uh, digital transformation at larger scales, you know, within a whole specialty or a whole market within Mexico, within Australia, or within a specific state. And all these, all these things are interrelated. Uh, there are, there's common uh, language between them, but also there are very specific, you know, scale-specific things to take into consideration. Another thing to take into to consideration is the issue of asset scale, and this is um, have always been a bit confusing uh, to people, uh, uh, you know, approaching the topic of adoption, um, because the type of asset and the scale of asset and the interrelation between these uh, asset scales is very important. You know, for for example, and this is just a simplified approach. The, we, we can focus on building and build facility and within buildings on the components. So this is really the, the area which really BIM has, um, you know, traditionally focused on. Um, but there's an overlap with, uh, you know, other uh, scales like uh, at component, subcomponent, part level, which is typically the area where the product life cycle um, management and similar concepts focus on, but also there's an overlap at, at larger asset scales with geographic information systems, etc. And across these these scales, we can study all of them if we adopt a system uh, approach. Meaning, when we look at um, information management through a system of systems approach, where we look at the connections between um, all of them by focusing on their interconnecting systems. Um, so uh, this is just a brief introduction to two to different metrics, which help us to shape a bit the discussion about capability and maturity. Um, but when when we're trying to to do uh, you know uh, trying to understand um, um, capability, maturity, adoption, implementation, it's useful to to just uh, you know look look at them holistically and say okay, what when we're discussing adoption and we're trying to measure adoption, what are we really measuring? Is it really the competence of individuals? You know, is there their skill, knowledge, uh, experience, attitude, uh, or organization will look at their readiness? You know, you know, they are getting ready to adopt, or have they adopted, started their adoption process, or is it the diffusion of uh, what has been adopted across the whole organization, whether it's a small or large, or if it's a project or teams? Uh, we're going up in the scale here, looking at the performance and compatibility between organizations, because as you know, you could have two perfectly capable and mature organizations, but they're not compatible if they work on, on a project. This could be because of a language or it could be because of te technical uh, issues, different standards, etc. And of course, when you look at markets, um, look at adoption and diffusion, uh, policy dynamics, incentives, etc. And for each one of them, you'll find that the series of, of metrics that can be used, whether it's competency sets or capability sets, etc. And how we intend to use this, these results in order to improve adoption and who most benefits. Now, these, uh, you know, this is just a simplistic approach or simplistic way of showing uh, this across four main uh, groupings of, of scales. Um, but, you know, for the keen uh, eyed researcher, you will notice that are, these things can be uh, connected. There is ways of connecting the language needed so to approach adoption, capability, maturity, implementation, et cetera, through a unified approach, so a unified language, which allows a policymaker, which allows an academic, allows a researcher to try to understand the effect of one uh, approach at, at, at specific scale on, on other scales. You know, the, the approach, of course, the easy ones would be the approach of uh, training uh, and improving competence uh, or competence-based learning within academia or uh, you know, traditional approaches uh, to, to learning within an association or organization and then the ability of that organization on projects etc but there are there are ways to look at this in a cross-sectional way uh, what what is common what what can be considered a universal incentive what would be considered a universal challenge across these scales in this session i'm just going to briefly focus on organizations and markets and 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 the reason for that is because i i'm i'm you know, I've I've uh, been fortunate to watch previous sessions uh, from from the seminar. I've uh, watched uh, you know 
Professor Eastman's uh, presentation, uh, uh, which uh, you know affects projects uh, in 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 the most sense. I have watched the uh, you know. Uh, Deeks, uh, Dick Smith uh, presentation. I have tried to watch the other ones in Spanish. And I forgot that that is cross caption. I could have watched uh, all of them, uh, but based on what I've watched, um, I would only focus today on a little bit on organizations, a bit on markets. But the picture will not be complete without understanding um, individual competence. Uh, project performance, uh, compliance with standards, etc. All of these holistically will give us a good idea of where to focus on in, as researchers or as practitioners when we're trying to improve capability uh, within a whole market or within an organization. There's different ways of looking at capability stages, and uh, we, um, I'm just going to take a, a little bit a, a, an approach that I've taken the past many years is to, uh, to first start with, with uh, clarifying BIM stages, as defined as BIM, but I would like to widen this a little bit together uh, to look at its essence. So when we're saying stages, it's just to say that you, for anything of me, you know, of meaningful of or of certain specific complexity, it cannot be attempted in one go. It means you cannot go from pre-BIM, from to the approaches and sketches to some something called full BIM, whatever that is. Uh, you know, is it fully integrated? Um, a process um, with product, fully integrated technology with the process and policy, um, process and integrated uh, with uh, policy and what you call digital twins, etc. So there's no way of, 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 of breaching that. There's no way of jumping this. We, we have to go through formal or informal um, stages between them. And one way of looking at this, which has over the years uh, proved to be useful in within organizations is to to understand this in in three stages. That when we go from pre BIM, we we go through a phase we call called, called object based modeling, and we say object based because this is what differentiates BIM from uh, previous understandings of three D CAD that must be object based. Um, then we go to model based collaboration. Again, the model being the central. Uh, language is sent to artifact. You could say it's, you know, a series of boundary objects can be defined uh, to allow uh, model based collaborations and then network based integration. Um, I'm not going to go into detail in each one of them. Uh, this is available in literature, but the idea is that, um, you know, when, when we're discussing uh, these different stages, is really the idea that we cannot achieve. Um, maximum capability or maximum maturity, the theoretical maximum capability, the theoretical maximum maturity without, uh, you know, not, yeah, this is just common sense, of course, having these stages. Now, what is not as, you know, as, you know, you know common sense is that these stages are, uh, you know, uh, highly usable in defining implementation approaches and learning approaches. Um, I would say, for example, like rather than focusing too much on the technologies, uh, we could focus on our own process, our policies, as is the case at the moment. We need to focus on uh, process, process, which has been the challenge you know, through all these different approaches that we hear in the market. You know, we started in the early, I don't, you know, I don't know, seventies, and then up till. Uh, late uh, 1990s and early 2000, focus so much on technology, 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 this, technology, that, software, this, software, that. And then rather than uh, refocusing on the process and improving processes, we have jumped to focusing on policies and standards and, you know, procurement models. But the challenge has stayed really the, co the connecting part, the glue that connects all these different things has not been approached with the same attention that technology adoption and policy diffusion has been approached. So these stages, uh, you know, whether it's stage one, stage two, really what stage one means is that it is something that an organization does on its own, really. Uh, whether it's about object-based modeling or whether about any technology you can think about, it's about building their own capability to, to deliver uh, something digital 
uh, which is uh, is 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 more productive or is more efficient or you know uh, or easier than uh, previous approaches. While the second stage would be more about collaborating with multiple partners. The idea is that it is a linear approach between one. Um, member of the value chain or supply chain with another member. So this stage two is about an architect working with an engineer, an engineer working with a client, a client working with a, uh, you know, an owner working with a construction company. So this stage two is about this linearity between, it's not only you're working on your own, but you're working with others, but still your relation with them is one-to-one. To moving to to something which uh, referred to as integration is where it's no longer linear. It's more about um, having some central idea, some centered approach, some integrated approach uh, to combine uh, the knowledge and 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 the products of different uh, organizations and teams uh, in a centralized way. You could you could you could look at digital twins, for example, as one expression, but it's a product based expression of the stage three of integration. Uh, the idea is that now we're putting all this knowledge, all this information in a, in a, in a, in a highly coupled um, environment that couples the physical and the digital. So stages is about the, the, the I wouldn't say the natural process, but the, 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 absor- the you know, observed stages of change in capability within an organization from working on their own to improve their adoption to working with others, uh, you know, in a, in a linear way, in a one-to-one way, to work in an integrated environments, which need to be facilitated by procurement uh, methods to allow this uh, or by policy mandates. What's post-BIM? Meaning, uh, BIM is, as a term, again, it's an umbrella term. Meaning, you could say uh, BIM is already gone it's no longer a valid term now it's all about digital twins and uh, who, who knows what other terms come into play but the general idea is that he was referring as a bim as an umbrella term and it's about digital transformation which doesn't really have an end doesn't really have a you know a specific um end you know it's, it's a, improvement will be is continuous it's natural to be that way, but let's say post BIM as a concept doesn't matter what what concepts or terms we use. We just need to understand that whatever these are, they are continuous and they will follow specific capability stages. And it follows from that we we there are certain things we we can do in order to to accelerate the transition between these stages. When we are looking at capability sets, is using one. Uh, the frameworks, so uh, the tri axle framework is that uh, looking at everything in our space as a as a as three things, a three axes. Well, I mean, I'm not going to go cover this today, but the idea is that um, stages is just one dimension, but we has also look at something called BIM fields, which is really about um, you know you know the topics we need in order to understand and accelerate moving from pre-BIM and between stages to other stages, what what areas we should focus on. And doesn't matter what we've, you know, is it about BIM or digital twins or whatever you want to call it. We need still to focus on technological solutions, on the software and the hardware and the networks. We should look at you know, the resource and the process part of it. We should also, of course, look at, at the, the policy aspects of it. Uh, so, so one understanding, one understanding the the the, the, the how, how we gain capability between different um, uh, stages. It's really it's about understanding what are the steps we need to take to move between them. You know, if if, one, if we we say there are stages, or you know, at least we can clearly see some common ground between organizations trying to improve their capability. And we analyze this capability and how it's changed over time. We could identify uh, the steps which are common between organizations across markets. And based on research, you can say that um, we, we can see them. You can see the typical steps that, that organizations need to take. We can see that they are made of technology steps and process steps and policy steps. Uh, although moving from one capability stage to another, 
uh, will have different steps and instances of steps, but the type of steps are the same. It's all about adoption of new technical solutions. It's all about changing the process uh, uh, process uh, in order to adopt these technologies to deliver the, the same or improved product. It's also about uh, changing the, the you know the, the protocols and the compliance methods in order to abide uh, by existing uh, laws and regulations, but also in order to 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 bring uniformity within the project teams. We, we we you know all of us uh, most of us most researchers would have their own frameworks of understanding change, um, but I think it it is uh, fair to say that. Any change within the digital environment would have to include uh, technological steps, would have to include, um, you know, changes in the process, and will have to in- uh, to include uh, protocols and standards and 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 uh, you know, following uh, policies coming from uh, top down top down actors. Now, capability is one thing; the ability to do one thing meaning is very different to maturity. You know, you could say, you know, I can't drive a car, someone else can drive a car, but my ability to drive a car is nothing compared to, uh, you know, a Formula One driver, you know, or, you know, it's, it's, we both can drive a car, but is it the same level? Is the same excellence? Is it the same, can provide the same results? So the idea is, and this has been a, one of the weaknesses in literature, uh, you know, at least uh, this is what I, I claimed in my research, is that combining the understanding of capability maturity as a single concept has has not, you know, give, was didn't give us a, uh, what we needed. We had to separate these concepts a bit and apply maturity for different capability sets. And when we say maturity, and maturity is really, you know, as I, I define it in, in this session and the research, is it's just about excellence. It's about, uh, you know, gradual, uh, uh, transformative um, uh, improvements that, that goes from, you know, an initial step, ad hoc step, whatever you're doing, whether you are delivering training or delivering a digital twin or doing whatever, from an ad hoc approach, to a, a well-defined approach. A well-defined approach is, is documented, uh, process-driven, um, but on its own, it's not enough to, 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 to improve performance if you stay at only following a set of, of, of well-defined rules. It, it, the, when you scale this up, it needs to be managed. There must be some kind of system or, 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 or maybe an actor, um, whether it's a human or a machine actor, to manage um, this delivery. And I, I typically given, a, and, and the third one would be integration, and, and uh, sorry, fourth, integration optimization. The example I typically give in, in lectures is, is, a, is a, I can give a couple of examples, one about, you know, how training is delivered within organizations. I always use this example because I experienced it myself as when I was working as a uh, IT manager, BIM manager uh, within an organization, uh, had to deliver training. Is the difference between um, ad hoc training where, where within an organization, for example, no one knows what kind of training they need or will receive and they can only access training by asking for it and sometimes they get it sometimes they don't they don't get it and that's what we call ad hoc approach to one one system or whether it's defined where every um member of an organization they know they have to spend or invest uh, a certain percentage of their time a certain amount of money uh, in order to upskill or you know, improve their capability uh that's called a defined uh, system but a defined system that works at individual or, or localized levels. Uh, you need some kind of centralization within an organization, within a, a market, in order to manage uh, these um, improvements. Uh, meaning, just imagine a, a company that allows everyone to 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 to, to training based on a defined quota. But there's no one managing the system. There's no training manager. There's no knowledge engineer. Um, there's no no way of understanding who got training. 
uh, who needs training. And this is where the managed approach for a defined uh, system is needed. I feel like just doing th- having a management of of one system and having other systems because, uh, as you know, uh, up using the system of systems approach, um, even an organization could be you know a system of systems where it's you have a training system, you have a a, a you know technology procurement uh, system, you have a um, output driven system. What are you delivering to your clients, etc.? So all these are separated. Even they are well managed, they cannot feed from each other. They cannot, you know, uh, learn from each other. They cannot improve. Only when we integrate managed systems, which are being well defined, we can then uh, improve the capability, maturity, the performance for an organization. And of course, the fifth maturity uh, level would be about continuous improvement. So, just to give you an example, you know, if there's a very big difference between someone who doesn't know what training they will get at an organization. Um, with someone who, when the, before they come in, they are pre-assessed and then come into an organization with already their system ready for them, uh, with already their trajectory for e-learning and implementations ready for them, with someone assigned to them to manage their progress and uh, and and for their training and learning uh, to be integrated with the with the project deliverables within that organization. And as you, as you, you know, if, if you, you know, happen to have read some of the materials from the initiative or from, you know, previous researches, that the, the connection between these different maturity levels are the same topics, same types of topics, the same technology topics, same process topics, same policy topics, meaning the things we need to improve our capability are the same things we need to improve our maturity, meaning we could adopt a, a technological solution to improve their capability. Uh, but unless we mature within the use of that technology or mature within the use of that process, etc., we cannot uh, reach higher levels of performance. And there is there is a there is a model uh, published uh, as a conference uh, paper first, and then uh, I think the journal paper as well. It, it, it combines them into a one model called the point of adoption model. The idea is again BIM as an umbrella term. We go from uh, you know something called pre-BIM to something called stage one, which is building your own capability, internal capability, where you first ready yourself. You know, an organization readies itself uh, slowly uh, up the hill. And then when it adopts this technology as an enabler, there's a capability jump. You know, a capability jump from someone who doesn't use email to someone who uses email. It doesn't mean that they know know how to send really well-written messages and they know how to create lists, et cetera, but there's a capability jump from not having a, you know, a car and having a car, not having, using a smartphone, using a smartphone on a, on a, on a, you know, within a construction site, et cetera. But this is just the point of adoption. The, 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 the trick is, and, or, you know, the approach is to improve performance is now to slowly go up to maturity client, to go from this ad hoc adoption that gave you new capability uh, to b- make it a little bit more defined and then over time more managed and integrated, et cetera. And this is the same when we go from one stage to another, whether I'm focusing on my internal ability uh, as an organization or as, you know, um, working on, on my own improvement of, of technology processes and policy to working with others, what we call stage two, the collaboration. It's another point of adoption and it's another climb of maturity. Same with regards to integration, another um, uh, readiness ramp, another capability jump, another uh, maturity uh, climb. Um, this is this is how you know this is witnessed as as uh, within organizations and how it's assessed uh, that there is a need for these jumps. There is a need for these readiness ramps. There is a need for this slow, sometimes painful climb over maturity, um, the, the curve. Um, but it's very clear when assessing organizations that it's never you know straightforward. It's never one company, um, you know. Oh, holistically changing or whether one company within a market uh, changing another one uh, similar to it in the same market will uh, impact change. So this is before jumping to to macro a bit, um, 
we can look at these things in different ways. We can look at combining the, these capability sets. You can have your own capability sets. Um, I don't think you can have your own maturity levels, but you can have your own capability sets. Um, and then uh, develop a matrix. Um, a matrix that is kind of a tool uh, that you can use internally. Um, I know this is, you know, the, the BIM maturity matrix have been used extensively in so many organizations and it has been translated in so many languages and customized and localized beyond what we've done in the initiative. Uh, this has proved to be one of the most used tools, it and the dictionary. Um, but this is one way of looking at capability, uh, you know, uh, you know, steps um, on here first column and these maturity levels and try to identify where we are and as opposed to we want to be and just then mapping on the steps needed to take to bridge the gap. You'll find though, you know, this uh, translated including Spanish on the womenxens.org website. You can, uh, there's a couple of videos, I think, online. Um, now, finally, I'm just going to look at macro adoption a bit. Because we said capability maturity is holistic, it must be holistic. So we need to understand it holistically, and this includes understanding, uh, you know, what happens across markets. And we've done, we've benchmarked this work. Uh, we've done a couple of uh, journal papers about it, but um, we did first some benchmarking in 21 countries, and then we did more extensive studies as part of the initiative in 13 countries, and then we stopped in 2019 and 2019. And we looked at the data and we, we we said, okay, in order to push it more, we have to review our tools and metrics. And now we have started developing um, metrics. We're at, you know, it took us more than two years now to get to this point. We are now getting ready to launch the next phase, which will be a little bit larger, more number of countries, but it will be more focused. Uh, we will have three studies to understand how macro adoptions happen in the country. But the idea is, the same. Um, these are top of the things we already published as an initiative. Uh, but the, the, the key the key metrics we use at that high level or you know this macro scale um, are, are summarized in these five models. Of course, it's not we cannot cover them all today. But the idea is um, there, there are things that now we know based on the research we, we've done will give us what we call adoption indicators. You know how adoption is faring within a market. You know, is it progressing well? What is our bottlenecks? Are they following best practice, etc.? I'm just going to cover a couple of these uh, today, which is uh, the mature components and the fusion responsibilities. And and you will see here that some of the language we use in organizational uh, maturity will come back to be used in macro uh, maturity. Um, and here the difference is rather than using the capability uh, sets. Uh, uh, needed for micro uh, capability maturity, um, we have a different set. We have eight main ones. So, you know, starting with, uh, you know, if you're assessing a market, we look at do they have clear stages and milestones where they want to go? Do they have champions and drivers? Uh, like, uh, for example, the initiative for uh, uh, BIM. Uh, do they have, uh, you know, associations and, on, on, and universities championing the change? Is there a regulatory framework? Is there, you know, enough... Um, uh, publications covering, you know, guides and, and manuals and things like that. Is there an education framework, et cetera, et cetera. But to measure these, it's not enough to find them. It's not, it's not enough to find these um, points or po these uh, um, components in a market. We have to measure their maturity. We have to use the same, same uh, you know, five-level maturity. Um, you can see these colors here. Um, the idea is, uh, you know, you could find them in a market, but they could be ad hoc, or they could be well defined, or they could be managed by a central authority. It could be integrated, okay, and then of course optimized. And we could have a, we have another maturity matrix, but this time for at macro level, and and we can use this information to 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 help policymakers to move forward. Another model here is that the idea is that using the same framework that we use at organization scale, which is these three fields of policy process and technology, we could identify um, nine main uh, players 
that that with across a market have uh, a role to play in pushing adoption. And there is a paper or a couple of papers uh, about this if you're interested. Uh, but we can use these two models together, for example, to to deliver a couple of tools that that policymakers can use. One of them would be the diffusion roles matrix, for example. Meaning, this is uh, the two models uh, mapped here. The idea is uh, if you're doing um, a policy adoption push within a market for BIM or whatever you want, uh, it's very important to understand the, the, the maturity components for the topic you're dealing with. And it's very important to understand the, the key players that need to contribute to this uh, push. And then mapping them together, you can identify who is responsible for what, who is leading and what, who is supporting and what, who is participating. And these models help, of course, in uh, reducing the complexity to make it a little bit complicated. I mean, it still, it still will be complicated, but reducing the complexity uh, down for, for these adoption approaches. Another way would be to develop a roadmap, um, here we're using the same uh, eight, uh, you know, maturity approaches, and then mapping them against time. Doesn't matter exactly what you put and what time you're you're focusing on. You know, what is your 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 milestone? What's important is to 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 use a, a robust framework in order to organize efforts. And this is, I mean, as common sense as it seems. This is somehow sometimes missed, and and we've done a review before about all these different roadmaps across countries, and you find some things that are missing, which are you know available. You know, you, you if you want, if you consider this the theoretical maximum, it's very rare to find an adoption roadmap in a, in a country which addresses all of them. You find some of them, not all. Finally, just a few words. You know, lessons learned. Uh, you know. Uh, these are very simplistic based on the topic and you know and uh, you know you, you, i'm sure the audience have more experience than i can bring to the to the discussion here but the idea is um you know digital transformation across the market uh, it must be done holistically we have to consider scale uh, we, we we cannot just say let's just focus on uh, centralization which is really project centric really uh, if you're ISO 19650 it's all about improving compliance on projects, we have to look at capability maturity within organizations. We have to look at competence of individuals, mm -hmm. develop learning framework, and connect them. It must be holistic. Uh, focusing on one scale, um, uh, on just on policy and just on technology or just on this or that will not work really. We have to to understand scale. We have to integrate scale. You know this. I mean, this is not target to academics. Um, we know the importance of long term. Um, you know, analysis of a problem, you know, testing solutions, etc. But I, I, you know, it, it, well, digital transformation, whether it is in a market or whether in introducing digital transformation uh, topics within academia, is a very long-term process, and it's a commitment uh, that it's above all, uh, you know. Uh, patience or persistence, but also needs, uh, as an initiator, a lot of clarity. You know, it's not about, let's, let's fix this, let's fix that. We, it must be done holistically and must have leadership. Um, championship is good, but it's better to have leadership. It's better than having a single organization doing one thing is to have multiple organizations working together like you guys are doing in order to push uh, for change. There is no, no shortcuts, whether in, in improving education, which is, uh, of course, one of the main components, eight components of um, uh, you know macro uh, adoption and improvement. There, there are no shortcuts. Everything needs to be addressed and we need patience and persistence and leadership. Finally, you know, um, we, we, and this is, this is, has been a, you know, something that have always, you, you know, intrigued me at the same time, surprised me, um, the, the, the willingness of people to just mimic or to imitate or to copy approaches from different countries. Um, you know, it, it, it doesn't work, really, it doesn't work. We cannot copy um, an adoption approach. We cannot copy an educational framework. We cannot copy, we can use ingredients, of course. I mean, we are, are well-tested, uh, you know, well-published, um, well, you know, well-experienced, let's say, 
um, ingredients that we can reuse in building our own approach and building our own capability, maturity, performance improvement approach. Um, but the solution must be recognized. Whether it's an education framework, whether it is a, a policy roadmap, it needs to use well-tested um, ingredients, but deliver a customized, localized um, uh, a solution so it can be accepted um, uh, by actors and pushed forward beyond the initial um, approach. So this is um, it for me. Um, thank you so much uh, for the invitation and I give back uh, the, the mic to you, Professor Alvarez, uh, if you'd like to open the discussion. Yeah, thank you. Very wonderful and outstanding presentation. Thank you. Thank you for that, Bila. So we have some questions here, not too many, but we have some. We have uh, one from La Martin Gantus, excuse me if I pronounce it wrong, from Brazil. He's asking, how do you see the advancement, the advancement of beam processes in less developed countries? How do you think in progress is in, in the beam, beam adoption? In, in less developed countries? How do you ah. see it right now? What is your perception? Yeah. Um, there is challenges that are in less developed countries will face for sure because the lack of support from policymakers, the lack of, uh, you know, um, incentives. You know, in some countries, as you know, um, they could spend a lot of money in incentivizing and training um, companies in order to adopt new solutions, and this is a big challenge for for uh, um, you know less developed countries. But at the same time, uh, lots of these lessons are learned by people who have went first ha have been published, and no country now will start from the same position as the ones before. You you can now start with. A lot of lessons learned. Um, if we cannot achieve, and this is very important, it's if we cannot achieve everything in you know, theoretically the theoretical maximum of digital transformation, there's lots of benefits to be achieved in achieving something, meaning in achieving some kind of uh, uh, adoption of tools if it's not complete, some kind of defined process if even it's not integrated. So there are benefits. For for you know approaching this, but I have to be honest here, uh, it is a very challenging to do a digital transformation across a market without a leader, without a leadership, without incentives. You can do it within smaller scales. You can, meaning, meaning the, the smaller the scale you have, the less the effect of of lack of development is on you. You know, as, a, as an individual, you can learn whatever you want. As an organization, you have much more possibilities. But when we get to macro scales, then the challenges become bigger and sometimes unsurmountable, sadly. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I agree. So I have another question related to the last one. Is how important is the modification of current regulations and laws for the development of BIM in a country? It's very important, but it, is not, uh, it doesn't stop the process. Uh, you know, uh, uh, regulations and laws come to to enforce compliance that has not it has no effect on performance. So we should not uh, conflate to um, you know even standards. Standards do not improve your performance. Uh, you, you can improve your performance without standards. Standards are needed when you want to work with others. So there's compliance. Um, having laws or not having laws does not affect your performance. It would just affect at your scale. But when you go up a scale. Uh, having these regulation rules will improve compliance, conformance, consistency across the market. Okay, thank you. And Elias Tavera is asking how BIM e initiative is working with governments to incentivize the increasing of knowledge and the use of BIM. Is working in, in collaboration with any government? Uh, we did a few, uh, uh, you know, collaboration agreements. We did a, a study with the uh, Inter-American Development Bank, for example. We did a study for five uh, countries about their macro policies, uh, so understanding the difference between them, the challenges they face, etc. Uh, it's more more about 
understanding the the, ch- the challenges. Um, you know, I, I also work with uh, with the with the government agency in Canada, uh, working with uh, with Plan BIM uh, in France um, to understand. So there's a lot of these things happening at individual, sometimes at initiative level. I always prefer it to be at initiative level, but it doesn't always work like that. The problem we have here is with all these different uh, approaches, they are separate. And this is the, 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 uh, what the initiative is trying to solve or at least address. There's so many good initiatives, but they don't learn from, from each other. Uh, as you know, within a country, we don't learn from each other, okay? And there's so many good initiatives across countries. So the initiative, BIMI, BIMX initiative is trying to uh, connect these and how to connect these through a common uh, dictionary, common language, through translation, so, so the provision of uh, tools and templates and model uses, etc., that that anyone can use consistently wherever you are. So we're trying not to. We cannot really impact collaboration, force collaboration, but we can provide easily digestible uh, components so anyone can use, which will eventually help people to use the same ones. If that makes sense. Yeah, then, then, then that makes sense. And then the next question also for Elena, from Elias Tavera. Uh, how do you, for, and I think this is interesting because he's asking how is the maturity level of the members of the, of the BIM initiative of, or the organization? Have you assessed it? Is, is it possible for an organization like yours be assessed it? Uh, using the maturity matrix or something to, to identify the maturity level that you are currently? Absolutely. Uh, that's a great <laughs> question. You know, you cannot, you, you, you have to to um, assess your own capability, meaning we, we, are, we are not doing it as the extent that we should, but the idea is every, every, if someone who bring, comes into a project, they need to have a competency profile to fit that project, okay? Now, each project is different. We have six projects. Uh, you know, if you're, you're, uh, uh, you want to become an editor or a viewer and a dictionary, there's certain things that you should have, like a certain experience, certain knowledge, certain skill, etc. Same if you want to join the macro adoption project, the certain we, we do profile you, okay? We do use competency-based language to profile the people who come in. Uh, or if we don't do, I mean, this is this is mandatory. I mean, it's not an option unless you do pre-profiling of the talent. Uh, you will you, these projects will stop. So definitely we use them, but we use them. Uh, in 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 a community based approach rather than an organizational approach, so it's a bit softer, let's say. Okay, that's interesting. So that's mm-hmm. good. And the mm-hmm. third question from Elias, the last question is: uh, What do you recommend to governments uh, or countries that are low level in maturity for in short time to overcome the current big maturity level? There's no shortcuts. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's sad. Um, it, look, if if there's one thing that that we can focus on and is not um, dependent on being a developed country is education. Okay, um, we may not have the tools or you know the fancy things and the, the policy driven incentives, etc. But education is a, is the the great leveler, correct? It it, it levels the, the as much you know it, to, to a large degree um, the differences. So the focus would be on what what the Initiative BIM is doing and similar initiatives is to um, educate, educate, train, uh, teach, you know, encourage all these things. Um, these are not exclusive to developed countries for sure. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. So that that's it. that is all the question that we have for our audience. But I have some from my own. <laughs> I'm going to ask you. Here in Mexico, we have uh, some time pushing and using the bottom-up approach as the only one approach for for so many times. The government has expressed uh, desire to to adopt BIM in a in a top-down approach. But it's not happening yet. It's, 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 there are signs and there is some efforts. And uh, just uh, yesterday, there was an announcement that is going to become mandatory in a very child level, but it's, it's good. But for the last 
couple of years, we have pushing bottom up. And that is the, the only approach. Do you think that this will help in something? And how, in, if that helps, how can we maximize the, the effects of our effort? We are very happy to do it. We are very happy to do it, but we, we would like to see more impact in the industry. So how do you, yeah. what are you talking okay. Yeah. I don't have I don't have hard evidence, but anecdotal uh, evidence would suggest that bottom up and top down approaches on their own don't work. Okay, the 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 the, the, the better approach would be what we refer to as middle out. Um, middle out is when we focus on large players within a market. A large construction company, one single department within uh, a ministry, um, power generation, and them, if they adopt and transform and mature, they will push down their supply chain or value chain, and they will push up uh, to uh, policy makers, and they will push sideways. Other pe other organizations the same size will imitate them. Okay, if there is anything, and, and this is this has proven to be at least you know anecdotally so far the most um, impressive way or most effective way of impacting change across a market, and this works within organizations as well. Meaning, just uh, you know, for those who worked within organizations. You try to push from bottom up. You adopt something new. You say, "Look, oh, this tool is amazing. This oh, why don't we change the process? This whatever," and then no, people don't listen to you. Okay, it doesn't go anywhere. You know, just some more uh, people around you, or the manager will say, "I want to be the best in the world in this," you know, but does not couple this with uh, with incentives or good policies. But replace this with line managers, people in the middle. Leaders within their own organizations, but at their at their line level, like like middle managers and uh, project team leaders, enable these, enable these, and you will see how they will push down with the, the people they work with, how other project managers within their organization will copy them, and how they will lobby and will impact change within the whole organization. If there is a way within, uh, you know, you know the, the market, you you. The, the questioner has mentioned to focus, or in Mexico, uh, you know, as you mentioned, Doctor, uh, you know, Professor Avares, to focus on these middle level players. I think you have a higher level of success, of course, coupled with some policy push down and continuous, uh, uh, you know, bottom up approaches. And in, in this approach, what do you think should be the 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 role of the academy? Academia is, is an enabler. I mean, it's, it's a layer that covers everything. I mean, uh, uh, but on its own, uh, it cannot do this in seclusion. I Meaning, unless, uh, you know, and this is coming back to the discussion about uh, roles and responsibilities at macro level. Academia play is, is a very important role, but on its own, it will not impact change without working with associations, okay? Without working with associations and working with 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 organizational players and working with policymakers, it's it will not work without academia. But academia on its own will not back change. This is my 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 understanding of the the problem. So, for example, um, initiatives like yours, if it has connections with uh, policy initiatives. If it has uh, connections with associations that bridge the, you know, you know, professional associations, there's a much, much higher chance of impacting change successfully. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm agree. I'm agree. And our biggest hope is that the students that we have, the students that we inspire, sometimes they get there <laughs> as a decision maker. Yep. And they took the decision. That that's with our long shot, but it's a long shot. <laughs> yeah, it's a long term as well. Um, yeah. yeah. So and this is the, the idea that it is long term. Uh, it is something that will take time. But at the same time, um, being you know leading initiatives and opening up the initiatives uh, for others beyond our close group. I mean, I'm not saying every initiative doesn't need to be international. But at least every initiative must be national, you know, and must include 
people from different sectors, beyond people who doesn't speak like you and me, you know, people who have different concerns. Um, having a, a group of like-minded people only works for certain things, it doesn't work for adoption. Yeah, yeah. I have another question here from the audience, from Juan Manuel Gutierrez. He's uh, asking, talking about collaboration and the bean maturity level, he said, sometimes we need to collaborate with some engineers or architects from other industries or other specialties. And sometimes they are not ready to, to do BIM yet. So how mm -hmm. can we handle all these uh, different level of BIM maturity or BIM capability? What is the best approach to this? Yeah, yeah. I would say we need to be generous in, in sharing knowledge. Meaning, um, and the responsibility falls on people who have more knowledge and more ability than others. Um, give you an example, um, and this is one approach I witnessed uh, like 15 years ago. Uh, there was a department here, now longer exists in one of the Australian states. The supply chain wasn't ready for adoption, and there's no way they will be ready on their own. They had to invest percentage of their time and effort in educating their colleagues, educating their supply chain. Here we have a lot of these mega projects, you know, rails, etc. They only work because they have an educational side where they, they do educate the supply chain. So if we're discussing horizontal relations like you and your colleague, it is it is good that you that you 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 have some community of practice, of research and practice that you go together. Um, every country has many of them. Uh, it's good that, that, that you take your colleague or invite your colleague or you know encourage your colleague to join these communities of practice in order to share knowledge. But the summary is you will face this as you increasingly improve your capability and maturity and, and you will find you are becoming a little bit more isolated the more you learn. There's no, the more you do it, it, but and the efficiency of the team is the efficiency of its worst performer. Okay, so you have to take others with you. It depends on the, the culture. It depends on the situation. But you have to, we have to be generous in in our knowledge. We have to share it. There's no way around this. Yeah, and and he also states at the end of the question that sometimes the the final ending is that all the team go back to to the drawings <laughs> and forget about the 3D model collaboration. Maybe some, some of them using BIM, but just for their own purposes, not for collaborating. And, and yes, that is so it's a stage one. Yeah, that's better than nothing, okay? Um, but uh, but look, they will only, uh, people will, you cannot, you can't force change. They have to, 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 it must be intuitive, you know, it must be easy for them. Um, um, it, it will come in time and it's, it's, a, it's a slow process. Sadly, there is no solution beyond education, uh, more education and incentives. I understand this, and 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 this is what you, the the question has asked is typical. It's not it's not weird. Um, it happens everywhere. Okay, don't 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 uh, believe the hype. Okay, mm -hmm. we just have to be persistent, and we have to be continue continuously improving our own performance and helping others to improve their performance. There's no, no way around it, even if there's setbacks, okay? It's gonna be up, three steps up, you know, two steps down and then three steps up. Yeah, we need to work together and, and not to be jealous of it. I know everything I, I don't want to show you because I don't think that it's going to work. We, we need to share, we need to, to, to help others to get in the same level. I think this, in the end, this will help the whole industry. Yeah, I have another, that you mentioned education, I have another question here it is from Erika Canche. She's a student of mine here at, at the University of Yucatan. And she's asking, in your opinion, what is the best way for the integration or adoption of BIM in the academia? How, how to assess the implementation of BIM in the academia? Yeah, we've done, we done uh, actually a, a research project in Qatar was funded by the government there. So you can see the importance of, of, of funding there. It took three years. It included four universities and and change agents as as the you know you know doing the competence modeling and the, the assessment and to identify 
the competence within a whole market and then how it affects education, okay? How it can affect education, how what could change in education. There's different ways of doing this. It always starts, I, mean, I, have a, I have a person of view, we need to focus more on competence-based learning and include it in our typical education. We have to be very clear about the objectives of, of learning. We need to have a very clear framework, but this frame, framework must be multifaceted and must overlap with associations. I, I, I'm coming back to the same ideas, meaning developing an internal educational framework, which focuses only on, on infusing current courses with digital transformation topic has an effect, but it's not enough. Focusing only on developing master level programs to focus on digital transformation or digital twins, whatever you want, is, is good, but it's not enough. Only with integrating. Again, we are defining what needs to change and we now with integrate. And when we're integrating at macro level, what are we integrating? We are integrating education. We're integrating associate, you know, education within universities. We need to integrate it with, with associations. So there is a lot of benefits to improve internally within the university, the educational programs. It's very slow. It takes five years to change a course. Um, you know, it takes five years to, to, to produce a, a good PhD or four years, whatever it is. Um, on its own, it's good, but it's very slow. We have to open up. We have to open up horizontally. We have to open up to collaboration internally and to, to, to other, other actors within the market. If I may ask, what is the state of the academy? in the academia in, in Australia is uh, doing good? Is this starting, is behind in comparison with the industry? How is it going? Can, can you tell us a little bit? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not too close to the, to the academia here. I'm not uh, you know, employed by academia here, but there's lo lots of good uh, research and lots of integration of digital transformation topics within undergraduate uh, levels. There are some master's degrees focusing on digital transformation, very similar to what you would say you would see in the US or the UK, minus the focus on standardization. Um, so there is there is a it's always five years behind, let's say. Again, academia is always five years behind. Um, but uh, when we're discussing education, research is, is one thing, but education is always five years behind. Because of the slowness of, of updating coursework and degrees and certification, there's no way around it, okay? So it's good, you know, it's maintaining uh, its relevance in this space for sure. And, you know, producing good research and well-informed practitioners. But the real education, to be honest with you, when it comes to these topics, starts the day people get uh, employed. Then say, okay, now let's put this in practice. Because, you know, if you, if you don't have collaboration with industry, Theories are good, frameworks are great, you know, but we have to put them into practice and the real education. And, and it's education, is, is, as you, you know, is a lifetime journey it's, it, and the university is just one, one stage, correct? Um, so industry and these associations have uh, a complementary role to, to what's done in education and Australia is no different to any other country. Yeah, I think it's the same worldwide. Yeah, yeah. It could be minor differences here and there, like uh, it could be a great professor here and a great program there. But overall, we are facing the same issues and we are dealing with the same bottlenecks like industry in the built, you know, in the built environment is a, is a, whether it's in education, or whether it is an in industry, we are a little bit uh, behind the ball, let's say. Yeah, I I'm, I'm agree. I completely agree. I have another question here from Christoph Kirmayer. Do you think that being uh, mandatory will be a better uh, solution, even if the institutions and companies have a level zero of maturity in the BIM process, then promoting collaboration and efficiency within organizations? No, it's, it's the worst thing to mandate something if people are not ready for it. That's the worst thing that happened. Actually, it has a... It has a the effect of it is it encourages cheating. It encourages the, the development of new professions that didn't exist before. Give an example. Like, like I, won't, I won't mention the country. Um, they mandated BIM without without consultation, without preparation, without incentives. They, they, it's led to the to the generation of a new class of professionals who generate models and sell these models and services to architects and engineers. So rather than you know the engineering and architecture and you know and other uh, professionals going up to this mandate, they actually stayed where they are 
And now there is another layer of services, which just technical services, in order to meet the mandate. Okay. The worst thing is to have a top-down mandate without, uh, you know, infusion uh, through incentives and training with with the mi middle and bottom layers. That that's not good at all. Yeah, I I think it's even worse to try it that way because it will be a very bad experience. And then to try to convince to do a second effort, it will be more difficult. Even. Absolutely. I yeah. totally agree with you. Yeah. yeah. You want to do it carefully and it, it collaboratively and across layers, meaning there is a, a role for mandates, but it's a role that comes third. Okay. Like, meaning you can't start with mandates. Okay. You have to start, okay, with information. You have to start with with guides. You have to start with incentives. You have to start with you know uh, encouraging collaboration and initiatives, and then the mandate comes to accelerate. Okay, it, it ca cannot instigate. It can accelerate. Yeah, completely agree. Now, if we talk about a little bit of the industry in regards of your concept that I find very interesting and I usually reference to your work a lot in, in, in my classes and in, in, my, in my talks, uh, talking about the capability and maturity, do you think that the industry is more lenient to a only or more lenient to a capability approach rather than, than uh, balancing between capability and, and maturity? Yeah, absolutely. Capability is easy to measure. Like it's it's very evident, you know. And it's like, okay, can you do BIM or digital twins or whatever you want? Yeah, I can. Show me here it is. Okay, you can see it. You can measure it quickly. You can. Can you drive? Yes, I can drive. Okay, here's my uh, you know driving driving license. Easy to prove capability. But is are you a good driver? You know. <laughs> okay. Do you produce good models? Uh, uh, do you do, do you follow best practice when it comes to collaboration? Okay, it's very hard, um, very hard to achieve and very hard to measure. Okay, so definitely uh, measuring capability is easy. Measuring maturity is harder, and also people comp can comp compile capabilities without achieving maturity. Meaning, you could go from stage one to stage two. Meaning, building capability. I can drive a car. I can drive a truck. Correct, but. Um, without spending time or a racing car, without spending time improving, defining the processes, managing them, you know, properly integrating them, and then moving to the next stage. The challenge is to slow down capability build up before maturity, really. We don't want to build too fast capability without building uh, maturity because maturity is harder to, to later catch up to too much, too much capability. And, and in relation with that, I think I, I have observed here in Mexico that most of the industry is, is lenient on the capability only. And sometimes that capability, they achieve it for participating in projects where they uh, require to the use of BIM and understanding of BIM and the BIM deliverables. They, they acquire this capability hiring a consultant. <laughs> and then mm -hmm. now they can drive. <laughs> they don't know how to drive, but they hire a driver. So, yeah, and, yeah, and that's the way it goes. And it's a comfortable uh, position because even when it's more expensive in a very immature mar market as is our industry, the 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 customers, the ending, the owners are paying for this uh, duplicity of work sometimes because uh, first the design is doing the, the, the traditional way and then that is converted to uh, the beam approach and then you have both approaches and you pay for them. Or both of them. Yeah. yeah. What, what What are your thoughts on this? Yeah. Look, having having a you know, someone to show you the way is like an educator, but like for a specified topic, is nothing wrong with that, provided there is knowledge transfer. Um, and this needs to be part of the strategy. I mean, if the strategy is to gain a capability and improve maturity over time. Um, Hiring consultants and advisors to do to help you at the beginning, it's okay, you know. But having a strategy to always use them, never gain the capability, that's really bad. And this is typically driven by top-down um, mandates. Um, this kind of uh, kind of behavior. So nothing wrong with education or training or whatever, provided uh, that knowledge transfer is part of the strategy. And now, talking about the BIM consultant firms, do they 
are obliged to pursue maturity or they can do it well with capability only? You can't, you can't get to maturity without capability, meaning you have to start with a bit, gaining some kind of new capability and then improving it over time. But but maturity is typically systemic. You, you know, it's, it's about systems, okay? Um, it's not about just gaining a new product or, uh, uh, you know, uh, implementing a new software solution. So so this is where the role of leadership comes into play, okay? So you're an organization, and you want, you want to become, uh, to work uh, collaboratively with others um, on projects, correct? Um, you bring in someone, you, you buy software, you bring in someone to do the training, you bring in someone to help you to adopt to ISO 19650, whatever it is. If it's done systematically, meaning you are spreading this training across the, the organization, you are changing your training practices, you are training your procurement practices, this is this is will lead to better maturity, okay? But if you only have a project, I want to deliver it, and then that's it. Um, that will not uh, lead to gain in uh, long-term capability or any maturity. Yeah, <laughs> agree. Okay, uh, there is no more questions. I have only one last one question and I let you go. Um, in some of your slides, you mentioned the post-PIN era. Mm -hmm. So what we will find there, in your opinion, what do you foresee on the post-PIN era? Well, you could say post-PIM is a post-term, meaning the term changes and now it's something different, or you could look at it more realistically or, or more in, you know, intensely and say, okay, forget about the terms for a second, forget about BIM and VTC and digital twins, all these things. What is beyond um, model-based or you know, things that focus on 3D um, and information in integration? If you look at other industries, you will find that you know, there's a certain maturity curve um, nobody has done research on that, but it's just uh, you know uh, you know witnessed that let's say that uh, you know after the growth in document-based workflows, there is a growth in, in our industry of model-based workflows. But through maturity, this the models get less and less, and the data is increased. So really, beyond what we're discussing about BIM and and and, and model-based approaches, it would be data-centric approach. And how do you know this? We know this from other industries. Uh, you know, integration of supply chains through, through information life cycle. So beyond them is, is, a, is a world where there are no real uh, focus on these intermediary stages of modeling, okay? And a higher, you know, focus on uh, information, information transfer, uh, information coupling, um, data. This hasn't taken shape yet. So it's still a blank page. But we know from other industries, you know, aerospace and, you know, and, and, and car industry that it's coming for data-centric approaches rather than model-based approaches. Wow, interesting. So if we have no other questions from our audience, I will thank you, Bila, for being with us. I know that you are pretty busy and you were so kind to make a room in your type agenda. And Thank you for the invitation. Stay here with us. No, you're, you're welcome anytime. And I, I'm going only to present your certificate of knowledge that I will send it to you digitally. Yeah. Yes, right. Thank you. <laughs> so here is our thank yous to you. And Thank you so much. For, uh, thank, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all for attending. So thank you. And for the rest of the, the audience, can you stay a little bit because we are now we're on, we're going to have the closing ceremony. So thank you again, Bilal, and see you around. Thank you. Thank you. See you around. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye.